All right. Um, thank you everyone for coming tonight. We're excited about South Coast Plaza and it seems like a lot of people are too because we have such an amazing turnout. Um, I'm Katie Horak and I'm the president of the Southern California chapter of Docomomo US. And tonight's webinar is co-hosted by Docomomo SoCal, the Society of Architectural Historians Southern California chapter and the USC Master of Heritage Conservation Program. And I'm so pleased to be joined by my friends and co-hosts, uh, Sian Winship, who's on the screen of SAH and Trudy Sandmeyer, um, also here with us from the USC School of Architecture. And I'm super grateful for their work in support of these events. So tonight's discussion is the first of two events taking place here in Southern California as part of Docomomo US's National Tour Day. The only national event of its kind, Tour Day is an annual celebration of modern architecture and design where local organizations curate a tour or an event on a theme. So when I learned that this year's theme would be shopping malls, my first move was to reach out to Gruen Associates to see if they would be interested in highlighting their work and legacy related to mall design for very obvious reasons. So when they suggested that South Coast Plaza would be a great area of focus, I must admit that the 13 year old in me got very, very excited. <laughs> Over the course of planning this event um, and also our off hours in person walking tour, which is taking place on Sunday, October 23rd. So those of you in town, um, please also join us um, on the 23rd for the tour. I really come to appreciate South Coast Plaza in a million new ways beyond just my nostalgia for the Esprit store of my childhood, and I know that you all will as well. So there is a um, timeliness to this discussion about post-war shopping malls with growing scholarship about the innovative nature of their planning and design, coupled with the shifts in retail consumerism that have rendered many of them obsolete. And this is where South Coast Plaza is really special, um, as you will learn today, in its ability to remain relevant and profitable despite these shifts. Although there have been some great adaptive reuse projects involving malls, these projects are few and far between, and most commonly, obsolete malls are demolished. And with many of them just approaching 50 years of age, there are very interesting discussions on both sides um, regarding the importance of their design and planning innovation, as well as the aspects of their development that are, to us in the 21st century, somewhat um, potentially problematic as we confront the social, cultural, and environmental implications of suburban development. So I'm, I'm really grateful to Docomomo US for selecting this theme, which has spawned some really interesting discussions nationwide and given us the opportunity to take this deep dive into our favorite mall, um, or at least mine from my childhood, South Coast Plaza. So we have a really great program ahead of us um, with Alan, Matthew, and Ashok on screen here. So I'll keep things moving along. But before I do, I'd like to extend a very special thank you to our panelists and our co-hosts at SAH and USC, and to Preserve Orange County for sponsoring our South Coast Plaza events and generally just being a great partner to us in preparation. I'd like to thank Gruen Associates, of course, um, sponsors of Docomomo US Tour Day and supporters of our events, both through research and participation. Uh, Vicki Rand, Chris Green for design of our beautiful promotional materials, and of course, the South Coast Plaza for their sponsorship and research support and for graciously hosting us when we come to visit on October 23rd. So we have three presenters tonight, Alan Hess, Matthew Parent, and Ashok Fenmali, and we've reserved some time at the end for questions. Um, so please do enter your questions into the chat at any time while the speakers are presenting, but we will hold off on answering the questions and hold off on uh, for discussion until the very end of all three presentations. So everybody will speak in succession. Um, so first up, we have Alan Hess. Architect and historian Alan Hess is author of 21 books on modern architecture and urbanism in the 20th century. His subjects include architects John Lautner, Oscar Niemeyer, Frank Lloyd Wright, as well as The Ranch House, Las Vegas, and Palm Springs. He serves on the California State Historical Resources Commission, as well as the boards of Preserve Orange County, Palm Springs Modernism Week and Design on Screen. He has been the architecture critic at the San Jose Mercury News, a contributor to the Architects newspaper, grant recipient from the Grant Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts and the Clarence Stein Foundation and a National Arts Journalism Fellow. So Alan's latest book, Googie Modern, Architectural Designs of R. May Davis, Davis New Love was published very recently in March of 2022. If you don't have it, get it, it's great. Um, he is currently writing a history of modern architecture in California. Not a small topic. 
Um, after Ellen, uh, we'll have Matthew Parent, who joined Gruen Associates in 2002, became an associate in 2010, senior associate in 2014, and principal associate in 2021. And he now leads the planning department, where he specializes in transportation planning, urban design, and business development. He has worked on a wide variety of projects, including the Union Station Master Plan and the Ontario Multimodal Transportation Centre Needs Assessment. And he is currently working on developing objective design standards for all of Los Angeles County and a project to extend San Diego's Blue Line Trolley from San Ysidro to Tijuana. A native Angelino, he has a passion for all subjects related to history and manages Gruen's extensive archive, which was very helpful to us, I will say, in preparation for these events. He has a special interest in Gruen's role in shaping Southern California and the U.S. for the past 75 years, which of course includes South Coast Plaza. And finally, um, we have Ashok Van Mali, um, who joined Gruen Associates in 1984 and was promoted to vice president in 1996. He became a partner in 2002 and developed and shaped Gruen's luxury, luxury retail group, born out of his high-end uh, retail commission for Barney's New York and Beverly Hills. He repeatedly works with clients such as Louis Vuitton, Dior, De Beers Diamonds, Escada, The Swatch Group, Salvatore Ferragamo, um, Balenciaga, Bottega Veneta, Harry Winston, Yadro, and Bulgari, including collaborating on uh, completing more than 250 luxury retail projects throughout the U.S. And internationally. Ashok has worked directly with the Seagrestrums and or South Coast Plaza, leading the architectural production of 25 luxury retail brands for stores and boutiques throughout the famed shopping complex, including the reopening of the largest Louis Vuitton store in the Americas. So with that, um, I'm going to ask Alan to begin to share his screen and begin his presentation. Alan. Great, thank you. And you can hear me too, correct? Yes, we can. Good. Um, well, I uh, may need to apologize because my uh, connection sometimes is unstable, but I'm just going to plow through this uh, anyway. Um, because um, I uh, I do have, um, I think, uh, some good credentials with Victor Gruen and Shopping Mall. Uh, as a child, I uh, went to Northland Shopping Center in the Detroit area. Uh, before it was covered up, when it was the original Gruen uh, concept for it. And I remember it distinctly. I had no idea who Gruen was or what architecture was then. But uh, it, uh, the theme of shopping malls has stayed with me uh, throughout my life. Um, I uh, am going to be talking... Uh, hold it. It just disappeared. I did something wrong. Sorry. Uh, oh, dear. Because you don't see my pictures anymore, do you? We don't. Okay, do I'm going to have to start it again. Apologize for that. And oh, where is it? Okay, okay, just a moment. Uh, there, it's behind there. I see it on my screen. There, can you see that? Can you see some pictures on the screen? No, we see a blank screen. A blank screen. Okay, let me try it once again. Um, okay, there's that. Then I go to Zoom. And I go to share screen, and here we go. Okay, I think this is going to work. And I share, and can you see anything right now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So many buttons on uh, Zoom. Okay. First of all, I'm uh, talking to you from Orange County. I, I welcome you uh, to uh, by Zoom to Orange County. Uh, it's the county south of Los Angeles County. And uh, what I want to talk to you about this evening is 
what role has Orange County played in the development of what I call the suburban metropolis? Uh, after World War II, the America, all American cities exploded in size on the margins out to uh, uh, what had been rural land, uh, but which became a new kind of city. Now, this new kind of city had really been started much earlier, around 1900 or so, uh, with the advent of the automobile. Los Angeles participated uh, in that development. But after World War II, as the population of California grew, and as the need for uh, new communities, new developments, new cities uh, developed, Orange County was one of the places where uh, there were innovations, ideas um, to solve this problem because what you see here is a picture of downtown Anaheim, California, uh, sometime probably around 1920 or so. And it is a traditional downtown, um, a Main Street, stores and uh, shops and theaters lining the street. This is the traditional city. This was not going to work anymore for uh, the American city as it spread out and was oriented to the automobile. Now, a lot of the planning, the new ideas about what this these new suburban areas were going to look like um, were not very carefully planned or anticipated. And there was a lot of criticism that this view of Anaheim near Disneyland, uh, there's a lot of criticism that this was not the way we wanted our cities to go. Uh, they, this was called blight by some. It was a crowded, confusing, visually uh, cacophonous. Um, I actually like it a lot and it is no longer this way. And I wish we had more of this um, around Disneyland than we have today. However, this is not the only vision for suburbia that developed here in Orange County. So I go back to the 1920s when the impact of the automobile was first being uh, felt and architects and planners were responding. How do you deal with this idea that citizens were now not walking through a city, but they were driving at 30 or 40 miles an hour? One of the inventions here in Southern California was the Miracle Mile, which you see at the top there. A.W. Ross was the developer and conceiver of this. And um, what you have is a linear downtown, Rainer Bannum called it, a linear downtown, where you have office buildings, theaters, shops, all lined up li linearly along Wilshire Boulevard. Um, then there was housing of all sorts, custom homes, single family homes, apartment homes, et cetera, on either side behind the boulevard. This was a real innovation and it still works today that this is still what the Miracle Mile uh, is like. And there is a connection then to what planners and architects invented after World War II, 1945 and beyond, uh, for these new suburban areas it wasn't going to look like the um, uh, the Miracle Mile, but it was going to involve these shopping centers. Now, there's an interesting link between these two concepts. <clears throat> In the top view of um, of uh, the Miracle Mile, you see on the left that tall office building it was designed by Morgan Walls and Clements. Clements being Styles O. Clements. On the bottom, you see South Coast Plaza in the 1960s. You see the Sears. It was designed by Clement's son, Robert Clements. Uh, Clements himself died basically the year that South Coast Plaza opened. But there was this idea, this continuing idea of how do we reinvent the city? How do we have office space and the office park and research parks like this, the um, Rockwell Corporation, factory and uh, office building in Laguna Niguel, California, uh, by William Pereira, one innovative answer to that. We have the Anaheim Convention Center by Adrian Wilson as well from this period. We have bowling alleys, places for people to play. Uh, and the Wonder Bowl, also in Anaheim, was designed by the firm Daniel Mann Johnson Mendenhall, which became a major architectural firm uh, in the country. Or for um, educational buildings, 
This is Orange Coast College, all, also in Orange County, uh, designed by Richard Neutra and Robert Alexander. There were all of these innovative ways of how you are going to serve, uh, have places to work, to play, to go to theaters, to the arts, et cetera, in Orange County as it, um, as it grew. Ballparks as well, Angel Stadium, and uh, that's uh, Gene Autry on the left uh, above there, groundbreaking. The man on the right, however, is Del Webb, who was another really important person throughout the country, really, in inventing, reinventing these cities. And of course, for inventiveness, nothing can really beat Disneyland, also here in Orange County as well. Walt Disney taking the ideas of how you make movies and applying them to civic and public spaces. Now, housing, of course, was very important for all of these people who were going to be there, uh, moving into places like Orange County. Uh, here's a map of many of the ones all over the county. Um, and there were many individual um, uh, housing tracks uh, all, all over Orange County being built, uh, some by some uh, very good architects, Beth and Williams, uh, Cliff May and others. However, Orange County did not leave it at that, not at creating just you know, individual tracks. Orange County led the nation in master planning entire communities, entire cities, uh, so that all of those uh, shopping centers and schools and churches and housing developments would fit together into an intelligent plan way. What you see here is the planned city of Laguna Niguel here in Orange County, planned by none other than Victor Gruen Associates. Uh, you see the plan there, it extends along a, a valley way going from the five freeway, the San Diego freeway to the ocean. This is in the early years and it has filled in considerably since then. For some reason, a number of these planned communities, we know about Reston, Virginia, Columbia, Maryland, back east, but Orange County had a remarkable concentration of these master plan communities. It was basically open space, agricultural space before, and it was suited people to not only plan, but to move into these areas. Shortly after Laguna Niguel, uh, the Irvine Company built Irvine. And you see the very first community there on the left. Um, on the right, you see uh, three men there looking over a plan. The man in the middle is Alberto Trevino. And he was the master planner of Laguna Niguel for the Gruen Company. And then he moved over and became one of the key master planners for the city of Irvine, where different types of houses, townhomes, single family homes, cluster homes, were integrated into green spaces with amenities like schools, libraries, churches, um, pools, et cetera, nearby. Uh, Mission Viejo is another example here in Orange County. And then Leisure World in Seal Beach and in Laguna Hills as well, which served the retirement community as well, master plan communities for another segment of population. All of these things were going on in Orange County when Henry Segerstrom, who you see here, uh, decided to build South Coast Plaza, one of the very first large shopping centers in Orange County to serve people here. Now, Segerstrom uh, started as an agricultural company uh, in the late 19th century, and uh, but Henry Segerstrom helped, along with his cousin Hal Segerstrom, helped to move it into a real estate company uh, as well. That was the direction Orange County was going. And Seekers Room had the idea not only of a shopping center, but also right contiguous to it, office buildings and uh, theaters, uh, facilities for the arts. Uh, both of these buildings, incidentally, were designed by Caesar Pelly. Uh, Segerstrom had a very high standard for the architecture that he um, uh, that he wanted built at South Coast Plaza and these cultural civic office areas around it. Now, I'll also mention for those of you who are coming down to South Coast Plaza on October 23rd, that the new Orange County Museum of Art has just opened. It's right next door to the uh, concert hall you see on, on the right. And it was designed by Tom Main of Morphosis. 
Uh, one of Segerstrom's other additions was the uh, uh, California Garden by Isamu Noguchi. Here you see two of the sculptures there. So with South Coast Plaza, here very early, still under construction, the 405 freeway hasn't even, it would be on the right, hasn't even been uh, finished at this point. But Orange County was inventing new ideas and putting them into effect in all of these areas. Here you see it more recently, where that framework that Victor Gruen established in 1967 has been filled in, expanded, and still works today. Other shopping centers we have in Orange County include Fashion Island um, and uh, Anaheim Plaza and Fashion Square in uh, Santa Ana uh, by Welton Beckett by, and William Pereira and other architects. To end up, I just wanted to share with you again from our Orange County pride down here, um, a couple of other buildings by Victor Gruen that are here in Orange County. This is the Charter House Motor Hotel, also in Anaheim to serve the Disneyland uh, uh, vacation goers. It still stands there. Uh, this California bank the building still stands. It's now a Rite Aid in Corona Del Mar. The sign is still there. The basic form of the building is still intact. And then to end up this uh, U.S. Post Office in Santa Ana, which was designed jointly by Victor Bruin Associates and Paul Revere Williams, the, the great African-American architect, um, not only building in Los Angeles and Palm Springs, but in Orange County as well. So uh, that just gives you an idea of what was going on in Palm Springs, or what was going on in Orange County when uh, South Coast Plaza fitted into this idea of inventing a new type of city and an appropriate architecture, a new architecture for it. So that's it. I'm going to stop sharing now, and uh, we'll go on to uh, to Matthew. Give me one second. We all good? Everyone can see everything? Yep, looks good. Excellent. Okay, uh, thank you, Alan. That was great to see some of those old projects. Uh, you've set the stage for me. Um, I'm Matthew Parent from Green Associates. Like Katie said, I'm a, I'm a principal um, uh, and a head of planning department, um, but I'm also a historian of, uh, of, of uh, all things Gruen, and uh, I'm excited to share. Uh, wow, there we go. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is uh, just talk a little bit about uh, Victor Gruen, the influences, and some of the uh, early projects that kind of led up to South Coast Plaza. And then I'm going to get in and show some fun pictures um, and lead you up to just after opening. And then and then uh, one of our partners will lead you into uh, what's happening uh, now. So here's the man. Here's Victor Gruen in front of the, this is a fairly iconic photo in front of uh, uh, Southdale Mall. Uh, that we can call it a mall. Um, just a little quick history on him, um, escaping the Nazis, coming to the United States, uh, first New York, and working pretty quickly uh, in, uh, ironically, starting in retail, um, and meeting his wife, um, you know, in 19, for his first wife in 1941, um, and starting a firm together. Um, and then coming to Los Angeles to um, sort of explore all the possibilities that uh, Southern California had to offer. Um, now, Victor Gruen was uh, born in Vienna and was really influenced by the public spaces um, uh, around his city. This is Ringstrasse uh, in Vienna. Um, 
And so he kind of brought that sensibility or wanted to bring that sensibility of a very pedestrianized, human scaled uh, place um, to his new home in the United States. So this is his first major commission in the United States, um, fairly dramatic. It's Letterer de Paris from 1939, um, right on Fifth Avenue. It's a leather goods store, um, pretty dramatic uh, facade that kind of draws you in. And all of these things sort of lead up, are gonna lead up to kind of South Coast Plaza, another early store, 1940, uh, it's a candy store um, uh, in New York City. Um, and as he moved, he's pulled to um, California uh, with his first wife, um, designing retail stores for Grayson's, um, J. Magnin, uh, all around um, the um, Northwest, Cal uh, Cal all around California. Um, and they really start to kind of develop a practice together. Um, this is something pretty interesting. As of early as 1943, they're already talking about, um, this is a, an article that appeared in Architectural Forum um, where they were outlining um, a new prototype for the regional shopping center that was more uh, inward facing, more European style, um, uh, that sort of separated the autos and the pedestrians. So some, a, more, a much more humane um, uh, facility than people were used to at the time. And here's some, some early sketches, um, but you know, already starting to think about um, different scales of, uh, of shopping centers and different types of shopping centers. Um, this is Mill Irons in, um, in Westchester. It still exists. Um, it's a Kohl's now. Um, but what's interesting about this project, it's, other than it's very early, is how they're starting to deal with the automobile uh, by um, putting it up on the roof. Um, you actually enter the main, one of the main entrances actually on the roof and you come down into the plan. Um, and it won a ton of awards at the time. I just like showing this picture. This Julius Shulman used to shoot all over photos. So I really like showing this, this photo of uh, the car going up the ramp. You can't actually do this now. Um, this is another unbuilt project. Uh, it's an unbuilt project in, in uh, uh, Whittier. It was called Olympic Shopping Circle. And it just kind of took uh, that sort of idea of the inward facing shopping center and separating the uh, pedestrians and autos um, uh, again to another level. Um, you could walk all around the, the, this, this ring as a pedestrian and not have to deal with a car. Um, also, at the same time, he was dealing with um, uh, all the service features um, of that, that uh, this building. So all of the deliveries and freight would actually come below grade. So the, again, the pedestrian would not have to uh, interact with any of the um, any of the vehicles that were servicing the site. And I, I think not a lot of people have seen this project, so I like to show it because it's sort of telling of, of things to come. Um, when the firm was actually, the firm was actually founded in, in 1951, some people say 1946, you know, we'll have to hash that out later, um, with um, uh, initially four partners, but eventually um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six partners. Um, Herman Gutman, Carl Van Leuven, Victor, of course, uh, Ben Southland, Edgardo Cantini and Rudy Baumfeld. And these were all sort of emigres, except for Ben, uh, uh, from, from Europe. And they were engineers, designers. Um, they all had complementary skills and they uh, really uh, were great collaborators in producing um, some, some really interesting designs. Um, that included the, the first, um, the first shopping center, and this Alan mentioned in Northland. So this is the one of our first um, shopping centers that was, um, it was a little bit different than what the mall would become. It was actually arranged around an outdoor um, shopping center. Um, it had anchors. Um, this was one, uh, this is uh, one of several that we did um, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, for the Dayton brothers. 
Um, this is there is also a South 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 Southdale Eastland and Westland. Um, this had 67 stores, uh, over a million square feet, and a lot of parking spaces. Um, and I like to show this because again, he's dealing with. Um, you can kind of see in the middle of this this image uh, uh, a, a ramp going down, and that deals with the the service um, uh, areas. Um, so this this really was about. Um, you know, making it again very pedestrian friendly. It includes art, um, arcades, um, just generally a much more friendly shopping center than people had been used to dealing with. Um, and then it included um, uh, things like, uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, again, this is what I was talking about with with the underground areas that service uh, the vehicles. This, this is a feature of almost all of Gruen's malls at this time. Um, um, and I'm doing this chronologically, so it might look a little jumpy, but um, started to take the idea of the mall and the shopping center to a larger scale. So this is the Fort Worth master plan from 1955, um, where he looked at pedestrianizing the entire downtown area. Um, so all vehicles would park in these gray parking structures around the edges and then you would uh, be able to get through the, the downtown walking or in public transit um, helicopters uh, and then the service vehicles would be would be below so you, again you would never experience um, uh, you would never experience a, a, a freight or delivery vehicle it was 100 percent about the pedestrian by the time we got to uh, Southdale, um, which was the uh, first regional shopping center uh, in the world. Um, the formula had started to develop um, with, you know, multiple anchors, you know, two anchors, uh, a large central gathering space that was double height with clear story windows, well lit, some sort of organizing element like a, a clock or a piece of art. Um, large fountains. Um, art is in all of the malls, these early Gruen malls, and even through uh, the 70s and 80s, it was good public art was always a part of, of these malls. Um, this is several of our, this is uh, Victor Gruen, uh, Herman Goodman, and Rudy Baumfeld, who was our, our design lead and also designed South Coast Plaza at just the opening of, uh, of Southdale. Um, again with the uh, service uh, aspects. And this also did something else which which happened at South Coast Plaza is it created um, a, a way to enter, uh, uh, there was no enter at the top level and enter at the bottom level, but you never felt like one was subordinate to the other. Um, you were, so it, it kind of helps for uh, tenants, because nobody wants to be on the top floor. Everyone wants to be on the bottom floor. So anyway, that, that is a reoccurring theme. And you can see the multiple anchors. This is Dayton's and Donaldson's and that central, uh, central gathering area. Um, this is another mall that uh, we did as part of that sort of directional mall uh, suite. Uh, Eastland in Michigan, um, 95, uh, 945,000 square foot mall. Uh, 8,000 parking spaces. Um, and then again, on the, uh, Victor was also playing with scale, um, you know, beyond the, uh, an existing downtown and creating a new downtown. This was a proposal for the World's Fair in, uh, for 1964 World's Fair for Washington, D.C. Uh, it was not selected, uh, but the idea was to convert the, uh, the World's Fair grounds into a, a new city that would be, um, you know, the, the, there would be high density residential office, amusement in the middle, um, transportation centers in the middle ring, and, uh, and then uh, low density housing, green space on the outer ring. It would all be connected through public transit, um, uh, which is, 
you know, if you look at the plans for the early malls, somewhat similar. Um, and I like to just show this because there is a relationship between the stuff that Victor Gruen was working on and people like Disney were working on. So there's there's uh, a lot of influence that was happening. Um, this is, of course, a plan for Epcot, early plan for Epcot. And you can see the, the book that Victor Gruen wrote, The Heart of Our City is the plan, very, very similar. Um, and just as he's building all of these suburban shopping malls, uh, Gruen was trying to revitalize urban downtowns. So there's several pedestrian malls that, uh, that Gruen worked on. This is uh, one for uh, Kalamazoo uh, in Michigan. Um, you know, it was a pretty bold move at the time to make these main streets completely car free, but you know, it was second nature to Gruen who had grown up with these types of things. Um, it was trying to recreate it in, in some of his malls. Uh, you can kind of see, um, kind of see the uh, Kalamazoo Mall in its heyday. Um, another mall that we did, which was um, yeah, Midtown Plaza, was actually a mixed use mall, a million square feet. But again, you can see that central gathering space. We have a clock as the organizi organizi organizing feature uh, and clear story windows. Uh, you can't see the fountain in this one. Um, Randhurst in Chicago, again, a million square feet, but you see the same elements sort of reoccurring uh, again and again. You know, the definition of a compact, safe, convenient pedestrian with uh, place with convenient pedestrian circulation and isolates all of the delivery and service activities. Um, you know, this was, uh, this was just something that Gruen did. Again, another mall in uh, Topanga Plaza, which is, um, which is in Southern California in the Valley. Um, uh, there's a picture of May Company uh, off to the bottom left, which was designed by Rudy Baumfeld. Uh, he also designed the May Company at South Coast Plaza. Uh, and then the last mall in that sort of mall suite, which was uh, Westland uh, prior to South Coast Plaza um, and Fulton Street. Again, this is, a, this is right before South Coast Plaza. So all of these ideas, these pedestrian, pedestrian streets, um, connectivity, uh, were all sort of percolating um, as, as Gruen was sort of getting ready to design South Coast Plaza. Um, I'm gonna just show you a few aerials to sort of get you oriented and see the kind of the development over time. Talk a little bit about the design, the phasing, construction, and then show you some some nice images uh, of the time period uh, when it opened um, uh, to, to round it out. Um, so just south, just to let you know, South Coast Plaza, even after all of these years, is still the highest growing shopping center in the United States per square foot, which is kind of amazing for something. This is true, it's been true since the beginning. Um, you can just see uh, San Diego Freeway, this is 1965. May companies under construction before the um, freeway was even built. And, and uh, the family that owns the land, the Segerstroms had a hand in routing the freeway so that there's a nice um, off-ramp uh, and freeway frontage um, to South Coast Plaza. Uh, you can see the May Company. Uh, it's one of the first buildings built. Um, 1966, 248,000 square feet. Just again, more construction shots. You just kind of see things as they as they start to develop. That's the a shot from Fortune magazine from 1972. You can see the May Company in a nice sunset. Uh, here's a shot that Alan showed of, of Sears. Um, it was the largest uh, Sears in the West at over 338,000 square feet when it was built. Um, you know, continued development. I think you even still see the bean fields that South Coast Plaza was built on um, in, the, uh, in the distance. And you can see the Financial Center, 1981. And this is a nice shot, I'll end in 2004, but you can kind of see these these bridges starting to connect to the other parts of uh, the town center. This is the financial center um, where the Orange County Performing Arts Center is and the new museum that, that Alan mentioned. 
and then the crystal uh, crystal court to the uh, to the west. And the mall is continuing to develop as we speak. And I think Ashok will talk a little bit more about that um, in his next presentation. Um, so the team uh, hired Gruen Associates. Uh, the Segerstrom family hired Gruen Associates. Uh, at the time, we had done over 50 major shopping centers in the United States. Um, and so we were the, the go-to people for, for malls at this time. Um, the director was, of course, Victor Gruen, but the designer was uh, Rudy Baumfeld, who was one of Victor's friends from, uh, from Vienna and, be, and was with him um, from the earliest days in the United States. Um, and then Carl Van Leuven, who was the partner in charge, um, who actually uh, was a set designer at, uh, uh, at Disney before joining um, uh, Gruen in our Midwest office. Uh, and this is, an early, this is an early plan showing some of the potential phasing uh, of the uh, South Coast Plaza and Town Center, which I think is kind of interesting. And then some of our, some of our early study models and you can start to see again the what I was mentioning before about grading and not having a uh, uh, a bottom level. Um, people don't even know they're entering on the top level just simply by the grading, and that also helps with with tenants. And then the way they were dealing with service, um, just some nice nice shots of the original model uh, and the the entry, which was actually uh, built just like this. One of them still exists. Uh, and then you can see the uh, carousel court in the middle. It was always planned that there would be a carousel uh, in the middle to sort of anchor um, anchor the uh, this central space. Some uh, some early designs. You can see both Sears and May Company um, signed on early to make this even possible. Um, the central the central uh, carousel court and see some of the design features already in just in the drawing um, and how they envisioned the uh, main mall spaces. And then phasing, uh, originally envisioned as a, a four phase project. Um, Tesco Plaza actually opened in 1967, March 15th, 1967 with 70 shops, uh, 520,000 square feet. And then there were, um, uh, three other phases that would further expand. Phase two would expand it to uh, more than a million square feet and 11,000 cars. And then the other phases, including things that are kind of off this drawing, but um, financial center. Um, it actually ended up being somewhat similar to uh, uh, what was originally planned. You can see the four phase, the uh, actual six phases, which includes um, uh, Crystal Court to the west. And then some interesting um, construction photos. Um, the groundbreaking was actually in 1965, so it was built in under two years um, with the contractor uh, CL Peck and Swinterton, which is still around in some form. Uh, early uh, South Coast Plaza would actually open, early uh, images of May Company, which actually opened before the mall uh, in, in uh, 1966. Uh, some more construction uh, photos. Um, this had a, a first first of its kind pre precast pre stretched concrete structural system that was the first time it used in California. Had an air conditioning system that was uh, designed by Victor Gruen, which was so large that they had to uh, helicopter it in, and it's for the entire mall, and it allows uh, individual tenants to also control their own space. Um, this is right before opening. Uh, some of our Rudy uh, Baumfeld and Herman Gutman um, just surveying things, uh, and then the actual photos of the mall itself. You can you can see uh, one of the early entrance shots. Uh, I really like these photos. Um, and like I said, there's if you go there now, there's one still in existence near Din Tai Fung uh, in the mall. If you if you go there for the tour, um, we also hired a landscape architect, John T. Raikin Associates, and they did the landscape inside and out. It was very, very lush and welcoming. Uh, the carousel court uh, with the um, uh, with the carousel, of course, which was uh, actually made from refurbished uh, carousel horses from 1855. 
And you can see some design elements that are still there, these fluted, fluted columns, these fluted wooden columns that uh, uh, on the bottom. And this clock, which is no longer there. Uh, and then Jewel Court down the way uh, from Carousel Court uh, with its uh, famous dome that was designed by Marion Sampler, who was uh, a graphic designer at, at Gruen Associates, one of the first uh, African-American uh, major graphic designers um, in California. Um, and it was built by Judson Studios. And this is a nice shot that actually Julia Schulman shot. Um, and then you can see other uh, images of the mall itself uh, near the time of opening with the fountains that were sort of falling down the stairs, um, the lush plants, a lot of light. Just generally very open. And it stayed like this. Uh, until some refreshes in the um, in the 90s, and then again in the uh, in 2006 uh, when we did a major redo of the public spaces. This is Sears um, early view outside Sears and the fountain outside the May Company. And I think I made it. I know I'm a little long. Sorry about that, Katie. No, that's perfect. Thank you, Matthew. So Ashok, you're next. Um, <clears throat> hi, uh, Matthew, that was a, a, a fantastic uh, overview of the South Coast Plaza. Uh, my name is Ashok Ben Mali. I joined Gruen Associates uh, in 1984. <clears throat> my first experience uh, with uh, architecture, uh, since I grew up, I grew up in South Africa and it's, uh, it was amazing that I came to Gruen Associates because my first experience of a large scale construction of a mall or a shopping center was uh, in South Africa in the late sixties. It was uh, a mall that I found out later was done by Victor Gruen. It was the Carlton Center and it was one of the largest construction activity at that time. And at that time I didn't know my career was gonna lead me to architecture and landed at Gruen Associates. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a complete circle that uh, that happened then. Uh, but when I started at Gruen in 1984, uh, I first was working on multiple projects. Uh, my first experience with a well-known uh, architect, Michael Graves, was the headquarters building for Disney in Burbank. And that led me to the next uh, project, which I worked on in Barney's uh, in New York, Barney's, New York in Beverly Hills. And that was working with uh, another architect called Peter Marino, who's well known in the retail industry. Uh, and then did a, another project around 1995 with Yardro, also on Rodeo Drive. And that led me and got me started in the excitement with uh, retail uh, and especially the luxury retail side. And my first luxury retail project that came up was in 1999 with Louis Vuitton when they started uh, their first uh, standalone store on Rodeo Drive, which was the original Fred Heyman building that was converted to Louis Vuitton. And again, working with Peter Marino. And subsequent to that, you know, my career started growing in the luxury retail and uh, it just expanded from there to Christian Dior and Dolce Gabbana and all those brands. When doing so, uh, South Coast Plaza um, has a lot of these luxury brands. And so uh, working with these brands, I was introduced to all these luxury retail in South Coast Plaza. And at the time when I started at South Coast Plaza with the luxury brands was early 2000. And at that time, the mall was still going through some renovations. And when I say renovations, um, the, the goal of uh, Henry Sigerstrom was to keep the, uh, the identity of the mall from its own conception, but refresh it without changing its identity. And so I was then introduced to the design committee, which I now am part of the South Coast Plaza design committee. And we review all projects that come into the store, uh, into the center. Um, part of the, in 1995, there was, uh, as the mall grew, the floor finishes and all of that was very patchy. So in about 1995 uh, and around there, we 
ended up changing all the floor finishes to this cross crud travertine uh, to unify the center so that it didn't uh, look like uh, you know uh, uh, you know parts and pieces of uh, a different uh, malls. So when we started connecting all of that, it started unifying the project. But the main goal was to keep the identity um, that the mall had from the beginning, and so not change the look that Victor Gruen had created for the mall. Um, some of the modernization that we did without changing the identity was trying to work with the individual storefronts, letting the tenants develop exciting storefronts, but keep it within the, the, the framework of what the mall was all about and being successful in that sense. And if you'll see the earlier photos of the storefronts, you'll see that they were much lower. They had bulkheads on top. And part of the change was where we as a committee decided was to increase the height of the storefronts by getting rid of the bulkheads. So some of these images that you see are projects that I personally worked on. Um, the, if you'll see right on top, the air conditioning slots was moved from the bulkhead into the slots. It creates a little shadow gap, but it made the storefronts taller. Uh, but we never lost again the identity of the, the, the mall itself or the, the center itself. The center still retained that identity. And even the finishes on the floor that used to be originally kind of a red tile finish uh, was taken out. And we went to this warm travertine finish, which was a, a cross cut travertine. And that with a, a border finish around, which is a darker Navona travertine, kind of unified and identified where the lease lines for each store was. But we still allowed, as you can see on some of these images, we allowed modern materials to become part of the storefronts, but not change the surroundings. And in that way, we kept the, the center the way it is. And uh, the, the, you know, the mall itself, at the time when it started, was um, driven by the anchor tenants. And that's part of the history of the, the center is how did you bring these, uh, the center to be successful in a place where there was no shopping in that area. And so Henry Sigelstrom had come up with the idea of having the anchors, you know, Sears and May Company become the, uh, the people that will start their stores. They sold them the land for very little money and said, okay, you build it. And then all the other tenants would come. And that's really what happened. But in the modern age, what's happening is these anchor stores are not really the driving forces anymore. At South Coast Plaza, What's driving the success of the, the center is the high end or the luxury retail. And so there's a lot of move towards making the luxury retail get bigger and bigger. And they no more these small tenants anymore. Uh, some of these um, luxury retail brands are now becoming two-story spaces. Uh, they are growing you know, from when they used to be about 1,500 to 2,000 square feet, they are now over 10, 12, 15,000 square feet. So they are getting more to become the size of the anchors rather than becoming a, you know, a small uh, tenant uh, within the anchors. So that's, that's how the, the center has been successful. They've been accommodating uh, the changes in how people shop. And uh, we meet pretty much on a monthly basis to see how we can uh, accommodate these changes and still keep the identity of the, the center. Uh, I think, uh, and as we said, uh, it is one of the more successful centers uh, that was built and continues to be so. Some of the brands, you might see them in New York, but um, they have a, be a bigger revenue in South Coast Plaza than they do uh, in other locations, even on Fifth Avenue. So there's something to be said about the, more, the, the brand and, and also the, uh, the center itself and how it was successful to be able to keep its uh, identity. Uh, I, think, I think that covers most of the, the, the centers as far as the luxury side is concerned. And more recently, what's happening is they're trying to maneuver these, the, these, the, the center, the um, tenants, so that when they re-sign the lease, they're trying to gather them so that they're all within the same discipline. And so it's not like all, all over the place, but they're trying to keep them more organized. And that seems to be also being very successful when you see, like for instance, on the image, you'll see Trobion on one side, you'll see Omega next to it. So there's a lot of this watch brands that are kind of in the same district, if you will. 
and then you you go further out and then you see some of them that are like the Louis Vuittons, the Cartiers and, and sort of Chanel and all, all of them are together also creating a district, but at the same time allowing people to shop from one end to the other and not lose the identity of each tenant. I think that's that's that covers it. And uh, this image that you see at the end, that was um, a, a, a image from way back when uh, the first uh, shopping center, I think this was the B Siegel Company in Detroit, Michigan. This is where uh, an image that we found in our library that we, we continually show um, that we started the year and we continue, we're still doing the shopping centers. So thank you. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and stop sharing screens. I'd like to invite all the panelists to come back um, to start your cameras again. And um, to our uh, panelists, thank you so much for your wonderful presentations. We do have some questions trickling in to our attendees. Um, Please, you can use the Q&A function if you'd like to type in your questions. Some people are using the chat too. Either one is fine. We will be sort of uh, selecting the, the questions from the Q&A from the chat to uh, foster the discussion between our panelists. So Matthew, is it you who has control screen? Do you wanna stop sharing um, so we can just see panelists' faces? I'm not sharing. <laughs> oh. Oh, it's at, let me see. Maybe I can. It says you are. Maybe I can force you off. Oops. Hold on. It says we're seeing your screen, Matthew. It, it is your screen, Matthew. There we go. Here we go. Okay. Oh. Good. Great, thank you. So um, I will go ahead and just start to uh, pull some questions out of the Q&A and the, the chat. I've got questions too. That was a really wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, Alan, Matthew, and Ashok. Um, I'm, I'm thinking some of you may have questions for one another as well. But um, just to get it started, I wanted to ask this first question that came in. Um, didn't Elsie Kremick also start the idea of shopping malls? I'm wondering, maybe Matthew, this is for you. If you could talk about um, her participation. Yeah, I mean, she she and Gruen were and Victor were hand in hand, um, but so was Rudy. Um, they were all kind of working together at the same at the same time. Rudy was involved um, you know, as early as 1943. Um, so yeah, Elsie had a, a, a had a, a big hand. In it. She was more of the architect. Um, Gruen was more of the visionary. Um, and so a lot of her ideas definitely made their way into uh, what would become sort of the model for the shopping center. So she deserves a lot of credit. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so Shane asks, growing up in Orange County, my grandparents would always tell me about the glycerin waterfall that used to be located in the court outside the former May Company. I've heard similar glycerin waterfalls were constructed at other malls of the era, including Gruen Design Malls. Is there a reason this cool design trend fell out of fashion and do you think it might <laughs> make a comeback? No, I mean, it sounds like an Oshawk question. <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, that's never come up uh, in any discussion, but, um, uh, you know, the fountains are becoming a big issue these days, especially in California with water shortage. So um, they, they tend to be uh, very reserved in terms of going fountain direction. So but that hasn't come up in any of our discussions, no. <laughs> um, Anant has a really uh, wonderful quote here. In one of the interviews about two decades ago, Henry Segerstrom was asked what makes South Coast Plaza so successful. To this, Henry Segerstrom replied, the reason um, is because I never considered it to be complete. I'm wondering, um, your, just your thoughts on that. Um, that's true. As, as I said, as part of the committee, we're always talking about innovating, uh, making, uh, and you'll see the transition of the finishes and so forth. Uh, but there's a lot of things that's underway right now, you know, how to repurpose some of the 
the building that Sears is, uh, you know, Sears is not really occupied anymore. There's other large uh, areas like Macy's and all that. There's this constant thought of how can we repurpose those. So uh, the, it, it is, it's a constant move towards making sure the center stays successful and those uh, go on for a while. But some of them are easier to cross and some takes a little longer time. Katie, I can oh, yeah. add to oh, that. Uh, Segerstrom's uh, words uh, reminded me of something very similar that Walt Disney said about Disneyland as well. Uh, there's a parallel there. But it also raises the issue of uh, why are preservationists interested in malls? They keep changing in so many different ways. Uh, should preservationists be interested in them? And uh, I think this is a great discussion, but basically what we're talking about is a framework. And the framework, I was struck when we were at South Coast Plaza a month or two ago, um, exploring it. The framework is still there. The concept is there, the grading of the site. So you have different levels, um, the, the circulation. Those things are you know, more or less the same idea as in 1967, but, so much has uh, changed as well. Um, and uh, I, so I'm really glad that Okamomo is taking this issue on uh, at this point. So Katie, I just wanted to say a little bit about the rain fountain. Yes. Um, so I'm obsessed with the rain fountain. Let's ju we're just gonna lay that out there. This is, I grew up in Orange County. This is something, you know, Alan House's presentation was like a, this is your life. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who's like 90 and older. But um, I I loved the rain fountain when I was like five years old. And so I had to understand more about it. And so as it turns out, there was a rain fountain, and not only at the Thousand Oaks Shopping Center or whatever that was, but at Monsanto at Disneyland. But the Gruen rain fountain opened several months before the Monsanto Fashion Fountain opened. And so I just think this is a really interesting topic. It's, it's about glycerin falling on these strings and illuminated specifically at South Coast Plaza uh, by all these different colored lights. And then they all go into this catch basin at the bottom and then they get recirculated. So I would just say, I think someone needs to do a thesis on the rain fountain. <laughs> Sian, maybe it's a book for you. <laughs> um, so a question from uh, from Alan Merson, which I was thinking this, I was sort of wondering the same thing. Um, he asks, uh, I think it was also in the 1960s that Beckett designed an open air century, the open air century city mall. What was the design motivation to put roofs over the malls in Southern California, where the weather is generally good, why would an open air mall not work in OC and other parts of Southern California at that time, whereas it makes perfect sense in a place like Michigan? Um, why also do it here? I mean, I'm not going to speak exactly what they were thinking, but I, I would, my, my guess is consistency. You know, you have, you don't have to worry about weather at all. Um, um, you know, you can control the light, you can control everything, you know, we can even control the music. I mean, if it, if you've been in South Coast Plaza, you know, they're piping, piping classical music 24 hours a day. It would be kind of hard if it were, uh, <laughs> if it were open, but, you know, I can't tell you exactly, but I have just the feeling that it was just purely consistency. Would you say that it would have, it was kind of a new trend that attracted people to uh, spend time in the afternoon uh, where it's enclosed and you have a nice air conditioned comfortable zone to shop rather than walk out in the open streets. Yeah, yeah. Alan, you, I think like you have something to say. Yeah, I point out a couple of things is that uh, Vienna, where Gruen grew up, did not have covered uh, indoor areas like this. They were streets and the shops and the theaters and everything were right there. So as a model, for a civic space, I, it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't needed to have them covered. Northland in 1954, for example, was not covered. It had outdoor uh, courtyards and you walked from the anchor outdoors to the other shop, uh, shops. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I am thinking that it may have been 
I'm thinking that it may have been um, that it was a hardier time and that uh, people like Frank Lloyd Wright in his houses had carports uh, that were open air. Uh, that was part of the times in the period. So uh, I think we're looking through it through 21st century air conditioned eyes. And they were new, you know, relatively new. People would rather stay cool than be hot. And especially those first ones in Minnesota um, <laughs> kind of needed a roof. <clears throat> yeah. I would just say that having grown up in Orange County, Fashion Island, which, you know, was kind of a fascinating place for me. And I know it's competition for South Coast Plaza, but it was like a horrible place to shop because it was at the top of the Jamboree Hill. And even though I understand this is a temperate climate, at Christmas time, you could die in South Coast, or excuse me, at Fashion Island because it was so cold up there. So that for me was, was a really, um, a reason to go to South Coast Plaza and just have everything controlled, you know, so. That's a good segue um, to this question about the competition from Fashion Island. Did that have an impact on South Coast Plaza when Fashion Island opened? And how did South Coast Plaza set itself apart, aside from being temperature regulated? <laughs> mm. I, you know, I, I, I've know, you know, we see the same brands that I've worked with that uh, I've, I've done projects out at, uh, at that center too. And, but it's never uh, kept the other brands from leaving this uh, location. They actually tend to be growing bigger. And I think the competition is really not theirs. Uh, the, the customer or the, uh, what they attract at South Coast Plaza is not necessarily the same uh, type of people that are shopping at the other center. I, I see a much more influential crowd that is at, at, at this plaza than, than at the other one. So it, it's a different di demographics, I think, but I don't see that uh, they kind of intermingle. They, they never seem to be worried about competition. So a question about the carousel. Um, I had a couple questions as well, but this one from, from a, a ten, uh, attendee. Is the carousel now the same one um, from when the mall opened or um, have the horses been changed over time with wear? I think they just refurbished them. Yeah, they, they've actually got one that's in the the office spaces and you, you, the cigars from offices where it were built during the time of construction with like these trailers they put together and that's that's become their the permanent office spaces. Uh, if you, it's it's one exit before, but if you go there, there's still these trailers with all the air conditioning units on the top of the roof, and the 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 Siegestrom uh, family home that's still there has been preserved. It's right next to the last piece of uh, the beam farm that's still there. Wow! And where did the carousel horses come from? Uh, they came from. Uh, they originally came from uh, a town in Pennsylvania. Uh, and then were bought um, and brought to uh, Northern California um, and and refurbished. Um, the car is the it's the horses that are old. The carousel itself was 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 newer um, and probably purpose built for um, for South Coast Plaza. Yes, that's what I've read that it was designed by Gruen, correct? Yeah. Um, so um, a question from Dan, curious to know about Frank Gehry's involvement at South Coast Plaza. Um, well, did I magnet? <laughs> um, Frank Gehry was actually, um, you know, I think he had left. He, we, Frank Gehry worked for Gruen for a long time. And by the time he did I Magnin, he had his own firm um, and um, was asked to do that project. Um, Alan, you know probably a little bit more about that than I do, um, to be honest. Well, yeah, I wanted to point out that um, one of our uh, attendees tonight is Jerry Cavanaugh, who worked for Gruen and then worked with Frank Gehry on uh, that Magnum's store. 
which no longer exists. The space is there, but um, none of the original designs. And it's well worth Googling and looking at what the original design, uh, the, the the graphics, the colors, uh, all of those ornamental elements for the stores were just, you know, real important mid-century modern designs. And uh, so we can we really appreciate those. See on. Well, I just want to share that I had the great honor to speak with Jerry Cavanaugh a couple of weeks ago. And um, I learned a lot. And also, uh, Deborah Sussman, the great, you know, graphic designer, was part of this. And so she and, and Deborah Sussman uh, were part of Gary and Walsh, which was a firm at the time. Um, Oh, they were actually, excuse me, not part of the firm, but they shared a studio space. That's very important to make it clear. But they all collaborated uh, together to make um, Joseph Magnan, which won any number of design awards. And if you want to see the really exclusive photos of what that space was like, you need to come on the tour on the 23rd. So. <laughs> Good Sorry, point. shameless, yeah. shameless. I was in advertising, shameless. <laughs> so, and just to confirm, the iMagnet is now Saks, correct? Or what is? Mm, I, I don't think so. Which um, I think it might be H and M, but I'm I apologize because I didn't. I was only there once in the last um, <laughs> sixty years, so I'm sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> uh apparently it's macy's men's that is um, okay well we will have photos of all of that that you know can be shared when yes. we're all there together in person we have a lot of uh south coast plaza devotees in our audience i love it we do um so many great questions uh a lot of questions about the future of the mall um and someone's curious just about the work of Gru and if you're seeing more requests for outdoor um, shopping centers these days, as opposed to these covered malls of yore. Uh, Gruen hasn't, no, we haven't seen any of those. I'm, I'm thinking that most of the centers or malls that are existing, most of them are just going through major renovations, uh, you know, just modernizing them. But I, I haven't seen any new ones come up, at least not in our, not in our portfolio right now. Sian? Oh, no, I really have nothing to add. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You've been very good about raising your hand. Yeah, no, sorry. I think that's an old raised hand. Sorry about that. Okay. I'll de-raise that. <laughs> and I'm curious, Ashok, because you've, you've been working for so long um, on different projects at South Coast Plaza. What you think about the, what is the future of the center? Do you see shifts even now um do you have any thoughts about the way things are going I, I, yeah, part of the shifts that i mentioned earlier uh, you know they they realize that the big boxes are not where it's drawing the crowds uh what you're seeing in the centers now is the uh the attraction is to the luxury retail type of customer level but also uh you know we've been talking a lot about what attracts people to these centers are uh, destination where you can bring children that they can play around and also food, uh, you know, exciting food places to eat so people can come in the evening and families can enjoy that, but not necessarily inside. They want to create these outdoor spaces that kind of tie into the, to the center. So you can actually enjoy the center, but you can actually sit on a nice day, kind of in a patio that's kind of partially outside. And there are a few of those restaurants there that seem to be always, you know, busy. And I think they need, they, you know, that's the trend is that maybe that's the direction that we have to take to keep it going. Mm -hmm. And why was there never a food court in South Coast Plaza? <laughs> Good question. That I don't know. I can't, it was pre my time and I, I could not answer that question. Well, I, I think, and there, I don't think there was a food court in any of his early malls. I think it was just sort of sprinkled around. So it was sort of like being on the street, you know, there weren't all the restaurants in one place. Um, but, you know, they are kind of sprinkled around the mall and you can kind of happen upon it. It doesn't make it as easy, but maybe it's convenient, somewhat convenient. Um, you just happen upon that coffee place or the, what was it, Emporio Armani? I mean, they used to have a good restaurant. Maybe I'm dating myself. 
It, it, it might be that <laughs> idea that when you go to a supermarket, for instance, you may want to go and buy what you need to buy is milk, but it's always at the back of the store. Why? Because you're going to walk down the aisles and buy everything that you never went to buy. And so maybe having all these food stores, you know, you're going to be hungry, you're going to look for food, but you'll end up buying things that you never plan to buy. <laughs> I think this is another thing where, uh, Sian, we need you to do uh, some research in another book. Where did the food court start? Um, oh, Lord. I, I, I don't know, Alan. I, I, I just want to be the hot dog on a stick girl at Halloween. I'm sorry. That's all I've got at this point. <laughs> Okay, okay. You can have a chapter on whoever that else out yeah. there. <laughs> whoever else out there wants to look into this, I have heard that Arden Fair in Sacramento was the first food court in a mall in America. I have no idea if that's true, but it's definitely worth uh, somebody researching that. I, I think we have some experts in the audience. Robert Kinsey says um, the food court started at Paramus Park in New Jersey. So good be. Um, so it is said that Henry Searstrom got the interstate direction changed and diverted towards South Coast Plaza. Was this one of the master strokes by by Henry? Yeah. <laughs> it absolutely was. And he well, donated like some of his land. He donated some of his land to the project. I would add that uh, Irvine also redirected the 405 because it was going to cut right through the first development and divide it in half. And uh, Alberto Trevino got Caltrans to move it to the side. So um, there was this relationship between uh, private developers and uh, uh, Caltrans at that time. They all wanted Orange County to succeed, of course. So uh, they, were, uh, they were working together. Sian, is that a new hand? Uh oh. <laughs> it's an old hand. No, I can't undo without my hand. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, was Victor Gruen involved in the South Coast Metro mixed use master planning? And if so, was he happy with the results and the progress? Any thoughts? I don't know. I mean, we, we've been involved in various plant, various phases of the mall over the years. I'm not sure exactly what project you're actually referring to, um, but um, we've done a lot of planning in and around the mall, and it was always sort of envisioned to try to find a way to connect better to uh, the street uh, beyond the bridges. But that's what I know for the moment. Okay. Um, from Adrian, it seems that many new mixed use developments today feature a shopping paseo with retail and housing office above. Do you think this has any links to the meandering mall experience or principles attempted with and often failed in pedestrian mall experiences? Hmm. That's a good question. Tough one. I would say that um, the history of the mall is one of evolution. Um, Matt, uh, Matt, your um, early um, designs that Gruen did early on, yeah. the thing is nobody knew what a mall was and nobody knew how it would work. There were very um, expert people, developers, who said, no, a mall will never work. You can never get that many stores together and have it succeed. So um, his experiment was really um, daring. And uh, then he hit upon the, you know, the, the, the early solutions, but it's evolving and it has kept on evolving ever since as well, including this idea of how pedestrians want to interact with, uh, with stores, the city street, pedestrian malls, et cetera. I, th I think it's also sort of interesting, you know, the original thought was that the mall would be more of like a civic center than a shopping center and that there would be residential and the parking lots were sort of where the residential would would be. And uh, some of those early malls are actually being redeveloped um, to include a residential component. Um, so the fact that some of the new malls you see, you know, like Americana, where people are actually living on top of 
of uh, a shopping center, it's kind of an old idea, you know? It's actually a really old idea. I mean, mixed use, you know, you lived over your shop. Um, yeah. but, I, um, I think that that's part of uh, trying to fight the traffic congestions. <laughs> Just come down and elevate and be to at work. That's that's easier than driving anywhere these days. Um, do we know how long Elsie Kremick um, practiced with Victor Gruen and what influence she had on his future practice? And was she ever part of Gruen Associates? No, they had their own firm. Um, they had uh, it was, it was uh, Gruen and Kremick. Um, I believe they got divorced. Uh, probably in the late 40s, early 50s, um, before Ruin was actually founded. Um, but they were practicing in Southern California and all up and down the West Coast. Um, uh, up and, and then she sort of stopped uh, being involved in architecture um, and did other things, other creative endeavors. Uh, after that. Um, and Gruen was just sort of the, the front man. He leaned, a, I think, a lot on people like Rudy for the, for the architecture. Um, um, but he was the guy that, you know, had the grand vision and could talk. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, and the current state of South Coast Plaza, are there a lot of vacant spaces or have um, the high-end stores expanded to fill all of them? How are they doing on vacancies? There, there, there aren't any vacant spaces. The, the high-end stores are expanding. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm currently working on a couple of projects where they are actually the first of my, a couple of them that are actually taking two level spaces, introducing elevators and stairs connecting the two floors. Um, but uh, they constantly expanding and are running out of space. Uh, and, and every time they do renovation, they have to move into a temporary space. So no, there isn't any empty space per se. And what would you like to see happen with the Sears building? Um, I think uh, it all depends on the supply demand. It, at this point in time, there's a big demand for the, as these, these uh, luxury brands are growing, you still need to replace the smaller brands that are there who want to stay. So it's just, I think that I, the way I see it right now, and I, you know, I'm just thinking aloud right now is that I think some of these big boxes may end up being, you know, turned into uh, part of the mall, more like the mall experience and become part of the shopping experience with multiple smaller tenants. Uh, I don't think the intent is to tear them down. Uh, it's just trying to repurpose them would be the best option both from an economic standpoint and also uh, how quick we can turn those around it would be easier that way mm -hmm. do you have any questions for for one another we have so many good questions from attendees i think i've made my way through nearly all of them if i've missed anybody's um, question please feel free to ask it again to bump it to the top um but any any questions for one another As people are typing in any last questions, we do have a few more minutes. I, I just would like to talk a little bit about our next portion of this series of events. Um, as mentioned, this is um, the first part of a two-part program, and we were hopeful that this could give everybody a really good background um, and understanding of the history of the, the region and the shopping center itself and the way that it has uh, flourish, not just survive, but flourish over the years. And we'll get to see it all in person together on October 23rd. Um, that is a Sunday. The mall doesn't open until um, 11 a.m. And so we're going to be opening registration at 8.30 in the morning. Um, and we'll have the place to ourselves for a couple of hours before the shops open. And uh, we did a little um, investigation, a little reconnaissance for this tour a couple of months ago and spent some time in the shopping center um, early in the morning. And I have to say it was a really special experience to go back and visit it in that way. Um, really got to, uh, you know, had some some wonderful sort of nostalgia moments, but also really had a chance to see the sort of the design and planning innovation, having a chance to walk 
with Matthew and with individuals, uh, representatives from South Coast Plaza. Um, and it's, there's, you know, even just taking the time to be able to really focus in on the design of the individual shop fronts. It's really um, sort of an extraordinary experience to do it without the crowds inside the mall. So invite you to come and join us um, on the 23rd. The link to our website is in the q and I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, please do register and join us um, on the morning of the 23rd. Alan. Katie, if I could add to that, um, everybody's been to a mall and you think you know it. But um, when I was on that tour that you mentioned and everything was quiet, you see details, you see how it fits together, you understand things about this really, you know, common space that we all know, but you learn more about it. So please do come. So I would just say that when I was asked to participate in this program, my first reaction was, well, I did the world's longest site visit because I was there from like 1973 until 1979. And I hadn't really been back until about a month ago. And I will just say that I have learned so much from working on this project. I see it in a whole different way than I ever did. And yet at the same time, I'm nostalgic for it. You know, it's like Wallach's Music City, Tom McCann. Okay, Eddie Bauer. Okay, it was, <laughs> it was a long span of time that I was there. Okay, I'm just gonna say that. But I will, I guarantee you that this is the program that you never knew that you needed to go to. Because I thought I knew everything there was to know about South Coast Plaza until I went back. And now I see that it's all about how do you get natural light into these spaces how do you service these stores how, how what happens neurologically when your eyes are moving from left to right between these stores so i really would say that if you think that like you know you know the mall or the shopping center you don't and so please come we will have lots of docents who know a lot about this and we have lots of historic photographs to share with all of you so please come and then go have brunch afterwards. It's gonna be a great day. Thank you. I think that's the perfect place to end at 7.30 on the dot. Um, so thank you so much again to all of our panelists for your wonderful presentations. And thank you to the attendees for, for coming this evening and for asking such wonderful questions. And we are really looking forward to seeing you on October 23rd. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.